right yep. at the bottom. Yep. Good. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are recording this session. So a um, couple logistics before I turn it over to John. Um, this is our, our first uh, fly tying uh, demo um, masterclass. Uh, we're very pumped about this. It's kind of a great way to kickstart the winter season and for all of us to start our tying. And um, a couple logistics before we get dived in here on the technical piece and turn over to John. Um, to optimize your, your viewing window, um, in the, if you scroll up to the uh, top right-hand corner, there's the view window. And there should be a side-by-side -side, uh, feature on that. Okay. That will come when, when we show the screen, when, when oh, okay. John shows. Okay. Um, so that'd be, that'd be best if you select that feature, because then you would see uh, John and his, uh, his presentation and or his tying uh, camera. Um, a couple other things. Uh, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, most of us are muted. Um, uh, to kind of, uh, we're, we want this to be a very interactive uh, presentation. But if any, at any time you have a question or for John, just take yourself off mute and have you manage that yourself and uh, ask a question you need to ask. And we want this to be interactive and fun. Um, let's see here. Anything else logistics wise from a Zoom point of view that I missed? If you don't know where the mute is, it's down in the lower left corner. There's a little microphone there. If you hit that, maybe it'll mute you. Hit it again. You can speak. But if uh, if you're on mute, if you just hold your space bar down, uh, you can talk. It'll unmute you. Right. Thanks, Kurt. So now I'm going to spotlight John. Uh, let me remove my spot, add, add spotlight. Remove my spotlight. And I'm going to go full screen on my side. And we should be good to go. Um, I'll just say a little bit about John. Um, I see John as one of my mentors in fly fishing. Guy has met much, many years of experience locally and regionally. He's just a, a person who's been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, and I think we're in for a special treat tonight with what with, with John has to present for us and, and sharing some of the secrets that have taken a long time for him to collect. So without further ado, one of our longstanding members and one of our charter members, in fact, uh, John Lively. Thanks, John, for doing this. Oh, unmute. Now, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Thanks, Matt. And uh, welcome everyone to our first uh, master class. I, I'm a little hesitant to call myself a master fly tire, but you know, I, in my, my professional life, I learned about 20 years ago, the definition of an expert is anybody who knows a little bit more than you do about a subject. So hopefully I know a little bit more about either fly tying or Cuda Creek or maybe something else. And you'll learn a little something tonight uh, from, from tuning in and, uh, and maybe even be entertained, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be moving between a presentation and my iPhone camera, which is gonna be focused uh, on, on the flies that I'm gonna be tying. But before I get into the flies and, and specifics, I thought it'd be helpful to give you a little overview of my workspace and uh, talk to you a little bit about, you know, kind of like when they talk to a rock star, they always say, what are your influences? So <clears throat> I'll tell you a little story about my influences. When I, when I first got into fly tying, and that's probably like serious fly tying. Well, hopefully, kick me if I'm talking too much, but the first flies I ever tied, I tied because of a Field and Stream article in like the 70s. And they were little cork, um, inchworms and bugs where you you buy the cork cylinders and you file them down with a nail file and you glue them on a hook, put a few turns of thread on them and paint them. And 
it was in you know the magazines and I sent away to E. Hilly and Williamsport and got the cork bodies and the hooks, tied myself a few and I went to Boy Scout camp and lo and behold, <clears throat> standing behind a hemlock tree, dabbling one of those things into a little you know, pocket of, of water in a stream the size of a, not even a bathtub, smaller than that, caught a few brook trout. And uh, from there, I, <clears throat> I kind of got detoured for many years by spinning, spinning gear and Rapalas and girls and career and everything. And I, I didn't start tying in earnest until probably 1995-ish. And when I really got into it and I wanted to, to learn, I bought a book by a guy named Oliver Edwards. And I think, I actually think the name of the book was Fly Tying Masterclass or something like that. Well, I gotta tell you, that was, <laughs> that was like, you know, going from being a volunteer at the hospital to brain surgery, like immediately. And uh, if you've ever seen that guy's flies, you know, they're like art, works of art and the, instructions for tying a stonefly ran over three pages and like 35 steps. So <clears throat> I kind of struggled through that. And uh, I also got a lot of tips, believe it or not, before there was a World Wide Web, there was a mail serve called at Flyfish where you could ask questions through email and then people would read the email and respond back. And there were a, a number of luminaries in fly tying at the time on that listserv. Uh, and I learned an awful lot just by asking questions and so forth. But again, there was no video, there was no graphics, it was all text. So imagine trying to describe how to tie a fly just by reading an email. So that's kind of how I came up. Um, one of the things that turned it around for me, you know, we've all read John Garrick. And Gear, how do you say, John Gearach, um, well-known fly fishing author, but his buddy, A.K. Best, uh, wrote a great book. Is that backwards for you? It's backwards for me. No, we can see it. Oh, can, see it. can you read it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, my screen is backwards, but it's Production Fly Tying by A.K. Best. And it's full of ideas and tips for making your tying more efficient and easier and things you never would have thought of. And uh, highly recommend, if you're gonna have one, if you're just getting into it and you have one fly tying book to read or check out, this is the one I recommend. Another thing I wanna show you is, <clears throat> you know, um, we all like to experiment and tinker and uh, try different things. And I, for the longest time, I was writing stuff down on scraps of paper and different sizes of paper and started a notebook and then forgot where the notebook was and everything else. So I finally got serious and I started a notebook. And I've only, you know, I've been tying flies for 20, 30 years and I just started this recently, but I, I write down the recipes for flies that I tie a lot of or tie regularly. And uh, it's made my life a lot easier because let's face it, you know, when, unless you're tying for a business or, or something, or maybe like Kirk, you tie it every morning over your coffee. But if you're like me, you tie the day before you expect to fish. <laughs> and, you know, it, and you're tying flies that you didn't tie uh, until last year, you know, a year ago. So having that handy uh, reference has, has helped me a lot. All right, I'm gonna switch over to my camera. Uh, let's see, I need to, and then I'm gonna just show you my layout a little bit here. Uh, this is gonna take just a minute. And I need to send that away. Okay, there's my camera. And if I turn it like this, it gets a little bigger. Everybody see that? Yes. I can't hear anybody, but all right, so. Yes. Just, yes. Oh, my phone's plugged. I'm going to unplug my phone there. So we're in my basement. This is my fly tying desk. It's just a chunk of Formica countertop that I bought down at Rhinos and Waverly and a couple of old uh, door bases. I've had it for decades. And, you know, I have a couple of lights, my uh, line winding 
uh, set up here. We're putting lines on uh, fly reels and whatnot. And of course that, that blanket is just for the video tonight. I don't normally have that. That's behind that is pegboard and a bunch of stuff hanging up. Uh, and then I have a bookcase over here. This is, this is how I organize my fly tying stuff. I'm not recommending it necessarily. <laughs> Everybody's got their own way, but I started with, you know, these, uh, these are for shoes that you buy them at the, I don't know, the, the Target or someplace. So I have my material shoved into these containers. And of course, once you use them, then, you know, you don't always put them back right away. So I have this box where I just throw stuff. Then I, then I figured out that these liquor boxes have nice little compartments so you can kind of, you know, make little bags of stuff. And uh, I just started doing this recently. So I have a bag for, this is for uh, materials I use to tie my, my uh, jigs for center pinning. This is bass pop, that my bass popper materials are here. Uh, I've got a bag over there for clouds or minnows and so forth. And uh, you know, if you're just getting into fly tying, here's one thing you're going to find out is whenever you buy something, it's more than you're probably going to ever use. And you end up accumulating a lot of stuff. Um, but that's just the way it is. All right, so let's talk about tonight. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about Cater Creek. And it's, uh, it's a local water. It's only it takes me 20 minutes from my, my door to the water. And so I've adopted it as my home water. I'm going to be each one of these paper or uh, solo cups is a fly that I'm going to tie tonight. That's uh, useful for there. Anything else I want to show you? Yeah. So a couple, two more things. So here's my fly tying bench that I'm going to be using. It's a Renzetti Traveler vise, it's a rotary vise, which is uh, I recommend even if you're starting out, it's, it's very handy to be able to turn the fly and look underneath and look at it from different angles. And uh, of course you can also uh, use the, the, the rotating feature to apply materials if you're wrapping something on there. A uh, Couple other things, double-edged razor blades are very handy. I always keep some around. My preferred scissors are these Fiskars with a little uh, finger loop. There, here you can see it. You can actually tie and leave the scissors in your hand. That's something that AK Best uh, recommended. Unfortunately, I haven't seen these in the store lately, but uh, they're at like, you know, Michael's and Hobby Lobby in this uh, sewing section is where you'll find them. They're about 10 bucks. Um, oh, and so this, this fly tying bench, you know, I made it uh, 20 years ago. It's completely uh, movable. You know, it's just a couple of two by fours with a piece of oak on top, screwed in with deck screws and a bunch of holes drilled in it and some nails to hold the, the spools. It's got a little uh, piece of wire bent there to hang stuff on. Very, uh, very much homemade DIY. And I have a bottom of a flower pot for my waste bin that, um, all my all my materials fall into and a couple other things that have been very helpful to me this is my thread box and you know it's it's great to have a compartment with uh, dividers where you can keep all your thread and everything but what's really handy is so I put this on there because I can never for the life of me remember you know it's eight out bigger than six out and when you go from one manufacturer to another, sometimes it's six out eight on, sometimes it's these other bin years measurements. So I got it all right there. If I need it, I can look it up. And I have another box just for my floss and tinsel and um, copper wire, B rib and lead and things like that. So those are just a couple of handy things that I wanted to, wanted to show everybody, all right? Now I am gonna put my phone on and <clears throat> on the stand here. Just give me a second. All right, how's that for everybody? Pretty Looks good. great. I'm just gonna leave it. Um, 
still good. I'll yeah, leave it there it for now. Great. Right? And, it looks great, John. <laughs> all right. And before I jump into Cuyota Creek, are there any questions on the setup or the general anything at this point? Everybody's, I'm not talking too fast. Everybody's following me. John, what all was good? What was, right. the, uh, John, what, was, what was the Oliver Edwards Burke book you mentioned uh, before the AK Best book? Oh, what was the name of it? Gosh. <clears throat> I think it said, I think it was actually Fly Time Masterclass or something like that. Okay. Um, I looked for it a couple of times. I don't think I even have it anymore. I think I sold it in a yard sale <laughs> because I found it excessively. Um, I don't know. You know, some people like to tie for the artistry of it, and I think that's great. And some of the flies that you'll see people tie are amazing. Um, I'm not one of those people. I tie for fishing, and uh, so my flies tend to be simple <clears throat> and effective and fairly easy to tie. Although there are, you know, some basic stuff you have to you have to know how to do. All right, so let me let me stop. Uh, Going to switch to the PowerPoint. All right, everybody should see the PowerPoint. Is that correct? I'm seeing. And there. now you should yes. see it full, full, full screen. Yes. All right, great. And I'm I'm going to assume everybody knows where Cuyahoga Creek is. You know, halfway between Ithaca and, and Horseheads, basically. Um, it's, uh, and I think I've already said this, what you might learn tonight. Cuda Creek is really my home water. Um, I grew up in Waverly, New York, and Cuda Creek flows through Waverly, where it, through some quirk of history and geography, it's known as Shepherd's Creek, but uh, it's the same creek. I fished that when I was a kid, you know, riding my bike down, holding on to my spinning rod. Um, that's where I, where I, where it all started for me. And I've been fishing it. So I've been fishing it for over 50 years. And I also, you know, there's, there's some conventional wisdom that's been, been around for a while. It says, you know, find a stream that's near you and make it your home water and fish it a lot. And you'll, uh, you know, improve as a fisherman. So I, I chose Cuda Creek. It's, uh, it's always, the, because of the special regulations area, it always has trout. So you always know that you're fishing over fish, which is a good start. Uh, it's 20 minutes exactly from my, uh, the door of my house to parking on the side of the road by the creek. So there's nothing better than, you know, that, than having a creek like that, that close. And so I've been fishing it for a long time, but since 2004, I, I went to, um, uh, to my database, which I'll describe in a minute, but since 2004, I've been on the water 219 days, average 14 days a year, and I've caught almost 2,000 trout. I've had more than 50 double digit days and 21 days where I've caught 20 or more trout. Um, so it's been very good for me. Uh, I, you know, I've caught more fish on other creeks actually in other places, but for consistency and, and for learning and for just having a great time, <clears throat> Cuda Creek's been really nice. And, you know, the source of all my wisdom is the database. I, another, another thing that was suggested way back when in Field and Stream or Sports of Field, one of them, was, hey, keep track of all your catches. You know, and you learn something. So I started with a, uh, you know, one of those school notebooks um, in like 1971, maybe. Writing down, or maybe, no, it says here 68. So I started writing down what I caught and when and the temperature of the water and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I never stopped. I'm just kind of compulsive. So I have this database with 80,000 data points and more than 4,000 rows, each row being not necessarily a day, but um, it might be a, a, a species because each species goes on a separate line. So if I caught 
you know, rainbow trout and a brown trout, that would be two lines, et cetera. But by examining this database uh, for Cuyuta Creek, I was able to select the flies that I'm going to show you tonight. Criteria being uh, one or more 20 fish days, fun to fish, easy to tie, and not really a standard pattern. Um, well, what the fishing log says is uh, the most trout were caught on Hendrickson of some kind, split between an emerger, a spinner, and a soft tackle. Uh, the next biggest catcher was black caddis of some kind, uh, and that's split between uh, the black deer hair caddis that I'm going to show you, a snowshoe caddis, which I used for a while, but I don't use anymore. Um, and then uh, an emerger and uh, a variation of Gary LaFontaine's deep sparkle emerger. I call it the UV sparkle grub. And then I, I put in a few other flies that are just absolutely fun to fish and also quite productive. Um, a skittering stone fly, a swinging stone, I call it the sunken stone and an early season streamer. All right, so that's where we're at. I'm gonna, so the <clears throat> actual flies, I'll flip through them real quick here and then I'll start tying. Fly number one is a Hendrickson soft tackle. Fly number two is a, what I call a Hendrickson emerger. I fish it during the Hendrickson hatch. Uh, three different caddis flies, all variations of black caddis. Uh, the sparkly merger and the deep, deep one. This is the what I call a cuta special. It's a skittering stone fly, and you can tie them in black or yellow. This is my uh, sunken stone. It's kind of a soft tackle with a wing, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I tried it and I liked it. Um, the fish liked it. And then streamers for early season. And then if we have time, I'm gonna tie a bonus fly, the olive damsel nymph, which, you know, it doesn't look much like a trout fly, but if I had one fly to use for the rest of my life, anywhere and everywhere, this would be it. Um, and you can tie it with, it's a one material fly, and you can tie it in about, you know, three minutes. So uh, we'll, we'll end up with that if, uh, if there's time permitting. All right, uh, questions at this point before I dive in? Everybody good? Somebody We're say good, something. John. We're good. Okay. We're good. All right. All righty. All righty. Um, I need to start tying. I'm going to switch again my view. The camera should appear. Looks good on my end. It's right in the middle of the screen. Yes. And I'm going to leave it at that magnification to start with. All right, I'm taking the first solo cup and getting materials out. All right, so uh, let's see here. So this is a uh, hook. It's a standard TMC 100 size 12. You can also tie this in a 14. Um, I like the 12. It, it doesn't seem to hurt that it's a tad bigger than most of the uh, naturals. All right, so this one is tied with a brown, brownish, reddish brown thread. Um, what I'm using is a six ot. It's jumping around a little bit. Can you see that okay? Yes. Oh, it's because, it's because I'm in the light there. Uh, it's a uni, uni thread 200, uh, no, uh, six ot, rusty, rusty brown. And I'm gonna just take a minute and lock the focus on that. Uh, there, okay. So first step, I'm gonna lock the thread in. Wrap it back to the back.
Yeah, of course I'm stuck on the, wrapped around the thing there. And you know, uh, one, one thing about my setup here is, if you can see this, but zoom out. Oh, what happened? There. I don't know if this happens to you, but um, you know, when you when your thread's hanging off the hook, a lot of times it'll start to spin like that. But with my setup, you can just turn the vise until it hits the uh, edge of the the table there, and it'll stop stop turning. So, John, it looks like the app is floating right now. Can you make sure it looks like the app is between wanting to exit and kind of floating on your screen. Is there a way you can click the app so it goes back to where you had it? How's that? It's on, on my on my screen here, it's right in the middle of the screen. Is it not? It's yeah, appearing it, differently it, now. It is, but it's small. All right, let me let me stop and start again then. Hang on. Better? I can still see your camera uh, app symbol and your text message app symbol in this view. It's like it's hovering. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I think it happened when you said there, you were going to zoom. There oh, you go. Better? Yes, I, that's better. I think yeah, it was the, I, the lock. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, it, it's when I took it off the, the stand and messed around with it. Yep. All right, so we've got the thread on there. We're going to work from the back toward the front. Um, this is the pheasant tail feather I'm going to use for the tail and the uh, back half of the body. And uh, gosh, don't ask me where I got it. Somebody gave it to me or I found it on a roadkill. But you can see how uh, a lot of times the feathers on a pheasant tail are like this. And they're kind of stiff and they're kind of uh, sticky, they stick together. But on the leading edge here, um, they're a lot softer and more forgiving. And these are the ones I'm going to use for um, for the tail and the uh, half of the fly here. So I'm just going to grab off a bunch. Got to remember to look and see. So I'm just going to separate them and squeeze them off. That's uh, probably a few more than I need, so. All right, hopefully, is that still in focus? Yeah. Looking good. All right, so I'm just gonna measure that against the, uh, against the hook. We're gonna go like length of the hook back set it back there and then grab it with my other fingers, my other hand, hold it in place and pick up the thread and just take a few wraps and anchor it down. And then I'm just gonna look at the tail, see if it's splayed out a little bit. It is, it's fine. And now I'm, I'm not actually gonna, um, oh, I know I was missing something. One, one more thing that's extremely handy I don't know if you can, can you see my face right now? I'm putting on my magnifying visor. Oh, love it. John, you, do you use the uh, the visor uh, with your glasses as well? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, and I use it on the low power. It has two two magnifiers. It's a low power magnifier uh -huh. that I use, but they make them now with lights and everything. I got this probably 10 years ago and uh, it's it's great. Um, if I'm tying a fly that I'm going to fish, I usually use Zappa Gap uh, at certain points um, to give it a little more strength and make it last more than a fish or two. So I'm going to be doing that here. And after a lot of trial and error, I use a, uh, a bodkin 
and a drop of glue on the back and to get just a little bit, and you can see there's hardly anything on there, but uh, you only need, all you're trying to do is lock that thread on there and you don't want it to wick down on the feathers or anything. So just put a little bit on there. And now I'm gonna hold this up because, um, oh gosh, what happened? Looks like we lost your, your, um, Shoot, your app man. there. Come on. Oh, great. Come on. Here we go. Here we go again. Come on. Oh, boy. Sorry, I'm trying to get my camera up. Yeah, I lost my mirroring. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm not sure what's up with that. I'll quit it and start it again here. Come on now. All right. Come on, it's near. All right, boy. Is that, can you all see that now? No. No. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I gotta, I gotta uh, share it. Hang on, hang on. I'm back, I'm back. There we go. There we go. Now you can see it, right? Yes. Okay, all right, good, 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 good. All right, so yeah, um, so this is the uh, front of the feather and this is gonna be part of the body. So I'm just gonna, oh, and there's one other material I gotta put on here. So uh, this is copper wire, it's a very thin copper wire. I'm gonna use this for the rib. And uh, I'm gonna take a little chunk of that. And I, you know, normally I have a separate pair of scissors to cut the wire with. I don't have them handy. I'm just gonna cut them with my good scissors, but I'm gonna use the very back of the, the blade of the scissors because mm -hmm. that rarely gets used for anything delicate. So cut right through that. And then uh, just lay that up there. Everybody see that good? If you can't, just let me know. So just wrap that up, cinch it down. And then I'm going to wrap up to about halfway uh, to, to the front of the, the hook. I'm going to put just one half inch on there just to lock the thread. I'm going to swing my, uh, my arm over there and drape the, uh, drape the thread over there. And I'm just going to pick this up and I'm going to separate that. There, and now I'm gonna wrap this up. Right to there, pick up the thread, get it around there a little bit, get that out of the way. A couple more wraps, I'm gonna keep that tight. 
So there's that, and now I'm just going to counterwind uh, the copper on there. So you hold it in place, another half inch on there, just for good measure. Boom. So I'm winding the rib on. there. And I'm going to get rid of this. All right, half the fly is done. I'm going to go back right to there. Now, the front half of the fly, I always get confused. Is it the thorax or the abdomen? I don't know. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the back half is the abdomen. I think so, yeah. And then the uh, front half is the uh, thorax. So uh, I'm doing the thorax next. So, you know, for Hendrickson, you know, I use this uh, beaver dubbing. And again, I've got to remember to watch the screen and make sure you can read this. I bought it at Pinewood Flies many years ago. It says light Hendrickson. And it's really a blend of sort of pink and gray. Uh, looks like, well, it says beaver. It's a mix of fine and, and not so fine uh, fibers. And it uh, seems to do the trick. I do wax my thread a little bit. I'm using, um, doesn't even, the, the label's gone on this. It's, but it's very, very tacky. Um, I do a touch dubbing method that I learned from Gary LaFontaine's book, which I don't even know if I'm doing it right, but uh, I get the, uh, the thread dirty with the wax. And then I just kind of smear this on here, like so. Touch it, touch it and rub it. And, uh, and then just lightly um, spin my fingers on there. I got way too much. Get rid of that. And it's okay if you end up with too much on a thread, you just don't, you don't have to use it all. All right, now I'm gonna, um, you see in, this, in the course of doing that, my bobbin went all the way down. <laughs> I got like inches of, uh, you guys can't see me, can you? What, what's going on? I lost my, there I am. You see it now? You see my finger? Yes. Yep. yep. Seems to be jerking around a lot. Anyway, yeah. So when you're when you're tying, especially for the new new people who are learning to tie tie flies, you, you, for better control, you always want your your bobbin. Uh, you don't want a lot of extra thread. So I've only got about an inch and a half thread out until the bobbin, and uh, so you, you're doing nice tight circles around the hook, and uh, it allows for a lot better control. I'm just gonna go around here, build this up. Boy, that's really fat. I don't like, it's too fat. I'm gonna take some of that off and uh, go a little more. Now, bear in mind, I have to put a hackle on here. I don't wanna wrap it all the way to the end. I'm just gonna do a little more. And I'm gonna leave. Try to leave a little more um, space on the front there. And uh, I'm gonna continue, no, I'm not gonna continue that. I like the way that looks without that. I'm gonna cut that off like that. I'm gonna put another half inch in just, just for good, good measure. Boom. And now I'm just need to tie in a hackle and we're good to go. Now, <clears throat> Any, um, oh, and I got a little extra thread here. Okay. Get rid of that. So at this point, you know, the fly kind of looks like a nymph. Um, and we're just going to put a hackle on the front. For, you could use uh, Hungarian partridge, you could use uh, starling. What I'm using and what I've been using for a while is. Uh, 
I can't read that, but it says chicken for soft hackles, parenthesis, Marie. So a friend of mine raises chickens and had one that had a beautiful gray color. And I said, if that chicken ever dies, I want the skin. And so one day I went over there and she handed me a bag and the skin was in there. Um, I've been using it ever since. And it's got a lot of these beautiful gray, uh, gray feathers on them. They're kind of picked through. Um, you don't need a very big one. Uh, I should have done this ahead of time. That one looks good. So there's the feather and Wait, it's free is my camera freezing up a lot? It, the camera just froze. It just froze. It was working fine until. Gosh darn it. Now. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Uh oh. Come on. Is it upside down for you too? Yes. Yeah. Oh God. What the heck, man? Come on. Uh-oh. Oh, this is frustrating. Come on now. Screen mirroring. Yep, lost mirroring again. Sorry, guys. What's the problem here? Well, I can't get this thing. I don't see it. What's going on? I may have to dial in as a participant yeah. if, uh, and use the other phone, you know, use it the other way if uh, I can't get this. For whatever reason, it's just stopped showing up on my phone here. If you want to try that, John, uh, you can uh, have a join as a participant. I'm going to try one thing. I'm going to kill my cellular, kill my Bluetooth, and then it's got nowhere to go except Wi-Fi. All right, I'm going to dial in. That's for the birds. Uh, where's my Zoom? All right, can somebody read me the meeting ID? Uh, Easily. Yeah, hang on a second. It's it's uh, in the invite thing. Uh, the meeting ID is eight seven nine four. Four zero nine nine three seven seven. Wow. 
And the passcode? Six nine five six eight zero. And I can text you the link if that does, that doesn't work. Does it work? Oh, oh, it doesn't, doesn't work. work. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. Now I got to mute. Okay, well, somebody mute. I muted. I muted my phone, but still getting an echo here. Get the, is the echo gone? No. Oh, there it is. So I'm gonna have to unspotlight his current view, Kirk, and spotlight his other camp, his other view. Want me to yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. Let me do that right now. And I, I don't need to share my screen right anymore, right? Uh, no, no. Okay, now I'm going to spotlight your other view here, John. There. We, we are seeing your desk. All right, oh yeah, okay. Okay. I'm still getting a stupid echo, but. Hey John, it may work better if you mute your uh, laptop and then um, and talk through yourself. So. How's that? How's that? Terrible. You got to uh, turn the volume off the uh, the laptop. Uh, how's that? That's good. Better. better, much better. It's gone. Echo's gone. That's now we just need to focus the camera a little bit. Yeah, that's the problem. I can't focus the camera when I'm sharing. It doesn't respond. It doesn't focus. Shit. This is not good. It, it's focused on the, uh, on the back. John, yeah. I think you want to move the fly further away from you, unfortunately. Yeah. And can you maybe try spinning your bobbin and see if that causes the um uh the camera to catch? Yeah, let me do this. Yeah. yeah. There there you there go. There you go. It just focused. All right. I'll try not to do anything to Unfocus it. No. no, no worries. We're all <laughs> we're all still learning here. No worries. Yeah, man. So looks good. You're doing great. Yeah, there's a lot of tricks there. Before the technology all went to hell, I had a feather in my hand. <laughs> I'll be damned if I know where it is now. <laughs> ah, I may have to just get another. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So as I was saying. Um, you know, the feather has all this fluffy stuff on it, which we don't want. So you just strip that off, throw it in the uh, waste can below. Strip the other side off. Strip all that stuff off. So I'm, I'm left with, you know, not a whole lot of feather there, but uh, plenty to work with. And uh, the, the the bottom of it is pretty stiff. I'm gonna I'm gonna trim that off too. So I've got about that to work with. 
right there. And, you know, I, I, there are different ways to do this. I tie it in by the tip and wrap forward. And yeah, that's, that's going to be plenty right there. Hmm. You know, the other way to, I didn't really measure this, but um, you're supposed to measure the hackle against the uh, length of the hook. Well, oh, that's, ter that's terrible. I can see it great, but you can't there. So I'm just laying the feather up against the, uh, the hook. You can see it's going to end up being about the length, you know, back to the bend, bend of the hook, which is about what you want. So I, I kind of got lucky when I grabbed this feather. It's about the right size. So I'm going to tie it in by the by this end, and then take two or th two, probably just two wraps, and then tie it off. All right. Um, so here's how we do this. I'm going to put my magnifier down, and I, you also can see here it's curving, right? See the feather is curving. I'm putting the curves toward the back of the hook. That'll just help it. Um, I don't know. It's aesthetically pleasing to me to do it that way. Probably doesn't make a darn bit of difference. All right, so I've got one, one wrap of thread, two wraps of thread. I don't dare do more than three because I'm gonna run out of room up here if I do that. But <clears throat> I am gonna put a tiny little dab of cement on there because the worst thing that can happen is the tip pulls out when you are wrapping it. So just a tiny little bit of cement on there. Wrap it over, put the rest of it on there, pull it back. So now we're tied in and we're ready to wrap. And of course I have to cut this off. Boom, gone. All right, and now I'm gonna take my handy dandy hackle clipper, uh, hackle pliers, courtesy of Radio Shack. Well, now I buy them on Amazon, but all right. And, oh yeah, and so what's really handy <clears throat> is if you can get the thread out of the way when you do this. So I'm gonna put it over here on my, uh, what's that called? The, uh, not the gallows, the, uh, thread holder and uh, I'm gonna lay it over there. I'm gonna take this, holding this in my right hand, I am gonna use the rotary function of device. And, no, I'm not, I'm just gonna wrap it by hand. I'm gonna go once around and as it, as it rotates, I'm gonna try to steer the feathers backwards. Okay, and maybe fold them a little bit as I go around once and keep it tight to try not to leave any slack in there. Two, now I'm gonna rotate up just to the end of it there. Take my thread off and get that end of the uh, feather locked down. If you lock it down tight, you can kind of let go get that out of the way. And I'm still keeping the thread tight. Go around again. And one more time. And I'm just letting it hang. And right now, just the weight of the bobbin is keeping that tight and keeping it from unraveling and whatnot. So now I'm gonna pull the, <clears throat> pull the feather to the side of the eye of the hook a little bit, get in as close as I can cut that off. And now we just need to finish the fly. And um, I'm going to put a whip whip finish on there using my fingers. So just these two fingers on the thread, twist it up and kind of holding these feathers back out of the way. I'm going to go one, two, three, that's probably enough. And then see, I have this loop here and I'm gonna pinch right there. That keeps the loop from 
like going where it shouldn't go, which is like over your hackle and everything else is gonna go right down, right onto the hook and boom, and we're done. Okay, I'm gonna tie that off. And then again, just so this doesn't fall apart after one, one fish or two fish, I'm gonna stick just a wee bit of zap a gap on there. Okay, and I, I probably got a little bit in the eye of the hook. All right, here's something I learned from AK Best book. Take an old uh, feather you didn't, didn't use. I keep a few on hand. So you strip the bottom of it and you stick it through the eye of the hook. And yeah, there is some glue in there. And you just pull it through one time and that'll clean it out and take the glue out of there. All right, so there you have it. That is the Hendrickson soft tackle. And uh, pretty, you know, and now the stupid camera is not, did it come back? Yeah, you're yeah. back. Yep, you're back. Yeah. Okay, so that's fly number one and it's, eight o'clock all right well we may not get through all of them tonight unless i can speed it up but anyway so there's one um looks good and uh here's something i learned from kurt kling and smith when you're tying just have a little piece of foam handy like a little chunk of foam so when you finish your fly you can just stick it in there like so and you know let it dry and get on to the next fly all right fly number two is also a Hendrickson it's an emerger uh, where's my bucket all right so this is also a pretty, pretty complicated. Well, for me, for me, it's a complicated fly, uh, but it's been very, very effective for me. Um, very effective. And it's, it, you know, this is the one I put on when the fish are just rising to Hendrickson's all over the place. Um, there's no doubt that it's Hendrickson's and you just want to get on them and um, I've had you know several uh, 20 fish days on this fly and I actually had one day on the Cohocton where I quit at 50. Um, it was just ridiculous. I just I started to feel guilty so I stopped. <laughs> come on come back camera stupid camera. Uh, believe me, the, the, the images were so much better when we practiced. I feel rotten that it didn't work out. Um, it tends to come back when you give it a full turn, John. Does it? Give it a full turn. Uh, yeah, for some reason, it really likes this, this thread back here. But... All right, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna use this, the same thread for this one. You could use a little bit darker thread also, um, just for expediency sake, I'm gonna use the same thread. And um, so this fly is pretty simple. It's, um, it's got a shuck, trailing shuck, some dubbing, a rib, um, a post and a hackle. So five, five things we need to put on this fly. And uh, maybe when I start wrapping it, it'll, uh, come into focus a little better. Oh, and the hook. Uh, so I, I like to use these curved hooks for my mergers. It's a, uh, so it's a TMC 2487. Uh, again, I'm using a size 12, you can tie a 14. It says uh, caddis pupae, emerger, shrimp, 
and it's uh, the key here is it's it's a uh, fine wire. Okay, if you want it to float, you want don't want to get one that's uh, you know standard or heavy. They make a similar size shape hook for things like glow bugs, and it's usually uh, you know two x heavy. So make sure you get the right kind of hook to tie these because you want it to float and float well. All right. Um, Let's get the thread on it. I'm gonna wrap it all the way back to about there. Cut off the excess. Now, uh, hey John, this is um, Zelon. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. You might tr might just try touching the screen where the in the area where the fly where the uh, hook is. Touch the screen of your camera, and it might focus right there. Yeah, it it that's the way my iPhone camera works. But when you're a Zoom participant, it's disabled, unfortunately. Okay. Sorry. So it, I I really wish we could get uh, a better image there. So this is standard Zlon. It's olive brown. Um, pretty standard stuff for shucks. And you don't need a whole lot. Um, that's 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 one snippet of off of the, uh, you know, as it comes out of the thing, and that's way too much. So I'm gonna take, you know, a much finer uh, cut. You just want like a hint of, hint of a shuck there. And I'm gonna use about a hook length. Have it going down like that. Just need to catch it on your thread and wrap back a little bit. And that's really all you need. You don't need a whole whole lot there. I'm going to cut off the excess. All right. Um, next thing is kind of a fun fun little variation that I that I put on here. And that is the uh, UV rib. And for that I use uh, UV flashaboo or UV, not, not, sorry, not UV flash, but UV crystal flash, okay? And um, it's hard to see it here, um, but it has a very de decided uh, blue flash, a uh, blue, blue color. And um, it, uh, it's kind of an attractor, I guess, I don't know. There's certainly nothing in the in the real bug that looks like that, but then again, it works. Uh, so I just tied that in. I'm going to leave it. I've got my dubbing for this one. I use darker dubbing. I suppose you could tie it with with whatever, but this is a very dark brown uh, Dubbing. This particular dubbing is Orvis. Uh, okay. Camel. It says Orvis Camel. But any any dark dry fly dubbing, brown dry fly dubbing. And I'm going to tease out a little bit here. Um, again, I'm going to put it on the a thread. I'm not gonna. You could wax it if you want. I'm. This sticks on pretty good. The beavers requires a little more stickiness. This this wraps on there pretty good. And I'm just gonna um, wrap on there. And I'm hitting the iPhone. <laughs> All right. Come on. All right. Yeah, and so notice I stopped, you know, before I got too far. I'm gonna tie in the post now. I'm leaving room in the in the front there to tie down the hackle and finish the fly. Um, this is what I use for a parachute post. It's gray foam. Uh, I think I got it. You know, it's like packing foam, or was used to pack something. This this one piece that I've got is probably a foot long. And an inch wide, and 
I've been using it for years. Um, what I do is I cut it down to a little post like this with my scissors, you know, um, and uh, you know, just kind of cut it like that. Get a little little piece. Doesn't have to be real tall, but I do. It is easier to work to wrap around if you leave it uh, a little bit tall. And then to tie that in, you can see how it's kind of square. I put the point down like that, and then kind of wrap it. Put the point towards the front. Come down on it like that. And if you can get three, four turns on it and mush it down tight on the front there, that's about all you need right there like that, that's good. All right, and then um, I'm leaving the thread hang. Now the hackle is kind of a brown, brownish dry fly hackle. Um, and I thought, did I already select some? Yeah, I did, so I've got a, Got one here, I think it's gonna be the right length. Yeah, pretty good. All right, I'll use this one. So again, like, um, like before, I'm gonna strip away the part that I'm not gonna use. Just so it's easier to, easier to work with. I'm gonna want several, uh, Actually, that's, I stripped too much off. I'm going to just strip the bottom end and then I'll quit while I'm. Some people strip one whole side and, and just wrap it, um, strip the entire side off and use one, one side only. I use both sides, um, seems to work okay. I, again, I tie in by the tip and and use use that as a starting point. Now for this one, you see I tied it in in front of the post, two wraps, and now I'm going behind the post, trapping it down again. So that's on there good. It's got four wraps of thread holding that feather on there. Um, it's not going anywhere. And then you just kind of trim off the part that sticks in the front. There's always a few stragglers that Trim that off pretty good. Okay, now here's the question. So what do I do? Finish the, uh, tie off the hackle first and then rib it or rib it first. I'm gonna rib first because uh, I want that finished and out of the way before I wrap the hackle. So here goes the rib. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna come back in front and I'm gonna half hitch it. And then I'm gonna stick it over here, get it out of the way. Now, this is going to go just for a rib. And around and around we go. And so now I've come back over the thread. I need to lock that in. Oh, come on. Yeah, I'm cutting off the excess there. Okay. Now um, all we need to do is wrap the, wrap the hackle and we're good to go. I'm going to start. And this is, this is so big, I don't really need a pliers on there. I just use my fingers to grab onto it and just wrap in a circle. Um, Try to keep it more or less flush on a, on a horizontal plane. And, you know, for a dry fly, my philosophy is the more hackle, the better. So. And, you know, after you get a couple wraps in there, you can kind of go low and, and go around the bottom of it. And it'll get you another turn and then go a little higher and get another turn or two in there and just keep on going. Get more and more hackle on there. 
And then if you think you've got about enough, um, it's hard to tie in. Oh crap, I just lost it. I lost a couple of turns there. Um, I'm gonna peel off a little bit more. Heckle, there we go. Cause I had a little more than I wanted. All right. Yeah, one more. And I'm gonna tie it off right there. So I'm holding the stem across the top of the hook. The thread is coming off the bottom, going up over the stem, but under the hackle. Okay, and I've got one solid wrap on there. And now I'm gonna grab onto the hackle and hold it out of the way to get a couple more wraps on there. And I may have grabbed a little, yeah, I grabbed a few, but that's all right, we'll trim them out. So here's what I'm doing. I'm using my fingers and kind of sweeping up and you can wet your fingers if you want, hold it out of the way. Now I'm getting two or three good turns on that feather, holding it up, cutting it off. And you see, I trapped uh, several, several uh, hackle barbs down under the thread that are sticking down. Those are gonna go to get rid of them. Clean it up as best you can. All right. And we're just gonna whip it and finish it. Oh, yeah, that's what's in the way there. It's hard to work with an iPhone three inches from your hook, but we do the best we can. All right. So again, I'm holding the holding everything out of the way. I got the thread on my fingers. One, two, three four, five, that's probably enough. And then pinching it with my fingers while I lock it down, snug it and uh, cut it. And once again, I'm gonna use a bobbin, a bodkin rather. And use the bodkin to apply uh, a smidge of Zappa gap. You can use your favorite uh, head cement on there. All right, all done, right? Nope, not quite. Now, that post is way too big. Actually, there's a little something there. So, um, and and what I've, oops, what I've learned is that post really can be as short as you want. Um, so I I usually cut it, you know, at an angle to kind of mimic a mayfly wing, but cut it like that. That's fine. Um, you don't want it much longer than that. If it's shorter than that, it's fine. But that's the finished emerger, um, Hendrickson emerger. Wish I had a. Can I get it to focus just for a minute here? Yeah, it was it was focused on the vice. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. So you got your your trailing shuck a little bit, a little little hint of it there. You got your brown body with the the UV rib. Um, a lot of hackle to keep it floating. And, uh, you know, it, it's very, been very effective for me. It's um, a little different with the curved hook and the UV, but um, try it. You might be surprised. Oops. All right. So that's. Looks great. Those are my two, two best secret killer Henderson flies. Uh, that I've evolved over the years. Um, right there. So John, uh, those look pretty deadly. Um, uh, one question on the, I want to jump back to your Hendrickson and Merger. Is there a reason why um, you tied that on a dry fly hook? Do you want that to ride higher, higher in, the, in the water column 
or are you fishing that at the surface? Yeah, I, I fish that like a dry fly. Okay. I want it to float the whole time. Mm. Yep. I, I mean, I, don't, I, I call it an emerger because it has its shuck and half, you know, the body is sticking down in the water, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, when you fish it, you fish it exactly like a dry. Great. A um, couple, couple comments here, uh, John. So uh, number one, I, uh, you're doing a great, uh, a great job here. I, I do not want you to feel rushed. Like you have to, you know, feel like you're obligated to get all your flies in. As, as Kirk mentioned at the beginning of the uh, segment, uh, we have some new high tech gear coming. And, right. uh, and um, if you don't get in all your content tonight, uh, rest assured, we can reschedule with the folks here on the line and get the remainder of your content in. Um, okay. another, another observation that you may not have visibility on because you're tying and you're looking at your fly. When you uh, put your hook in your vise and you uh, start putting on material, and one thing yeah. I noticed is when you brought your, your, the hooks in, the backdrop, the close backdrop focused in on the, on the fly. Um, so I guess my only question is, is, yeah, when you put, could you, is there any, do you have any options available to do a quick makeshift backdrop that's a little bit closer? Um, if hmm. not, um, that's, that's fine. Uh, but I think that a, a quick makeshift backdrop, maybe about six inches away, there, that may help a little bit. Um, I don't know. That. Let's, uh, do you have anything maybe a little bit darker, like a, like a blue or a, a black or... Try that. It's not big enough, probably, huh? No, oh, it wants to be. So, and can you can you slide that closer? Can you slide that 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 backdrop He's... a little bit closer? And let's see what that does. Um, better. Maybe. Yeah. Let me get a hook in the vice. Yeah. I mean, it's what it's 20 after eight. I'm not going to get them all done by yep. nine o'clock. There's no way. Yep. yep. Um, and I, I don't want you to rush through your content either. So we have some new gear coming that Kirk and TC have done a deep dive on. And for the remainder of your content, I, mean, I would propose that, you know, we get back together and I don't want you to feel rushed or anything like that. And when you do starting, when you are starting to get materials on the hook, it does focus. So uh -huh. this is just the makeshift um, way of having it stop and bounce. Yeah, this back is not forth. not my preferred solution. I just, you know, yeah, um, disappointed that the other solution crapped out on us midway. <clears throat> so should I go ahead and do a few more, or I, yeah. I would yeah. you rather wait? Yeah, Aud audience members. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that okay? The plan would be for him to finish his content and not be rushed in, in the time we have remaining. And then we'll get out, go offline and, and give John the tools uh, he needs to uh, finish that. Is that okay with you, John? Is that cool? If, if, if we reconvene for the remainder of your content with the new gear? Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going anywhere this winter, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and John, don't John, don't feel bad. Hey, we're all learning here, <laughs> um, and this technology—it's uh, all new. It's new to everyone here, so don't don't feel bad about that uh, by any means. And certainly, we 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 definitely appreciate you uh, going the lengths you did to to dive into. It worked great, everyone. During the, or we did a, a a dry run of this. It looked great. So it's just the technology. <laughs> we're still yeah. we're all still learning here. I yeah. have a couple of pages of notes anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, then I feel good. Yeah. So it's good, John. So we're gonna we're gonna call it an evening then. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's if let's let's, let's do that. Let's. Um, or, I mean, we I, could, I, here's the, here's hey. the option: finish the content with finish the content you want to finish within the forty minutes you have left, or we just decide to uh, reconvene at a, at, a, at a different time uh, with the new gear. 
Um, well, I'll tell you what, what, why don't I, <clears throat> why don't I tie a couple of the simpler, bigger flies okay. tonight to, to round it off. And then when we, when we get back together, I'll do the three caddis and the two stone flies, which are a little more detailed and, um, a little more complex. I think they would really benefit from a crystal clear image. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know. That, yeah, that's that makes sense. All right. So, you know, change gears a little bit here. And we would and we would pick pick that back up at another date in yep. between the other uh, sessions. Yep, I will. I will coordinate that with everyone here on the line, and and John, and with Kirk and TC on the technology setup. And uh, we should you should be hearing back from me within a week or so after I coordinate that and when the part two is of this. Very good. So stay tuned, everyone. I'll I'll send yeah. out part two and um, and I'm really really stoked. Um, from what Kirk and TC have researched on on these on this new camera setup, it should enable a, a really crisp image for everyone. Great, yeah. Well, this has been good, regardless, you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I would say that John is just um, the image is 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 not as great as before, but it's not bad. So don't don't fret it. I I think okay. keep going. Uh, we're all learning. Uh, all right. but we we can see your fly well enough to get the gist of how to tie it. That's all right, so um, I can still go back to my uh, presentation, right? Um, I'd have to stop. I'd have to um, unspotlight this view. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, you know, I demoed this one. Hendrickson soft tackle and I demoed this one, the Hendrickson UV immersion out. It didn't look blue like that in here. Um, but when you get out in the sunlight, it, it really sparkles. This yeah, was taken outdoors. That's blue. Uh, on, a, on the stream. So it's, it's, it's kind of a cool, uh, cool effect, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna do these the, uh, in, during part two, the, the Caddis series. Uh, there's three different ones. I'm going to do the, the skittering stone and the sunken stones. And uh, that'll be five flies. That'll be a good, uh, good part too. And then just to round off tonight, I'm going to do a uh, streamer and my go-to all-purpose fly. <clears throat> you know, the, the streamers, and I, you know, years ago, I gave a talk on Cuda Creek for the club. Um, and I told the story about you know, when I'm, when I'm fishing, I'm always looking at the other fishermen to see what they're doing, especially if they're catching something, right? So one day I was up there on Kiuta Creek. It was, you know, not too, not too long after they stocked in opening day. And uh, I was kind of nymphing with, you know, a size 16 hair's ear or whatever and working down through. And I knew there were fish in there because the water was kind of high and dirty and they'd been stocked, you know, not not if not but a few days before and you know car pulls up guy hops out stands on the bank with a little spinning rod and he flipped a rapala up through the, the hole and first cast he, he nailed a, a two-year-old brown and you know the next 10 minutes he got three big browns out of there <laughs> and uh and, you know said see you later took off um and it just opened my eyes you know and i've got other friends that, that fish that creek a lot and you know I, I'm showing a couple of the popular uh, hardware items there you know very small Rapalas or uh, Panther Martin spinners and the little Clio um, or the little goldfish spoons they all they're all popular and they're all popular because they work and of course the other thing that's super popular early season is salted minnows and, uh, and, and they work tremendously effectively too. So I decided to tie a, something that would imitate those things. And I, I, uh, actually the flies here, this is gold and silver um, flashaboo fly. 
to imitate, you know, a Panther Martin or a Paula. Um, and they work real well, you know. Um, when that water's dishwater green, I call it, and you can only see about six to 12 inches, just uh, swing that down through a hole and hang on. Um, I guess nowadays they call it a Crelex fly. It's tied with something a little different, but I, I tie them with the same old silver flashaboo that I've had sitting around for 15 years. Um, what I'm going to show you right now, though, is my I kind of evolved a little bit from that, and I tied. I I like to use this one. Uh, this this will work when the water's real high. I tie it with lead, and when it's the water's coming down and it's a little clearer, I tie it with bead chain eyes. It's side clouser style, and I tie it with Arctic Fox. So. Um, Couple things. If you're if you're a, uh, more of a beginner, you'll see you know Clouser style. You'll see B chain. You'll see Arctic Fox. So I'm going to put the hook in. Uh, now, uh, you need to spotlight my phone at this point, Matt. Uh, your phone is currently spotlit. Can you stop screen sharing on your computer? Yes. Let's see what the area, there, there we, we go. go. That worked. Come on. Oh, that works. Works pretty good. Oh, and as soon as I take my hand away, boom, nothing. Oh, okay. Well, hmm. That's going to be really hard for me to put a backdrop right there and tie. Sorry, but it is. Um, yeah, and I need to switch thread for this too. I tie it with white thread, so I'm going to put this away. Get my white thread. Oh, here's a tip for beginners too. Um, bobbins. The bobbin you get with your fly tying kit is crap. Throw it away and buy only bobbins that have ceramic ferrules on the inside. Okay, they're smooth, they're polished, they will never cut your thread and they don't cost that much, but the all metal, all metal bobbins like this one, uh, I only use it for things like wire, lead wire, copper wire, uh, because they get frazzled and frayed and then they cut your thread and it's no good. Um, Where's the end of this thread? Sorry, just need a minute to get. In an ideal world, I'd had two or three more. Um, two or three more of these to, I wouldn't have to switch, but. All right, ta-da, my, my white thread. And, oh, in the hook. This is a number six. TMC 5212 size six. And it says two uh, X long, one X fine, down eye, perfect bend. Uh, it doesn't actually say streamers. It says caddis, hoppers, stoneflies, and terrestrials. But uh, anything this approximate size and shape will work fine. There are lots of hooks similar to that. All right. First, I'm going to put on the thread. Catch the thread, do a little wrap. I'm not going to go back too far because we're going to put the eyes on next. All right, now if you've ever <clears throat> you tie a lot of bead chain like I do, uh, after a while you learn that you do not have to buy the bead chain eyes. You just need a lamp cord like. I have this hanging around. 
this is just your standard pull cord for a for a ceiling lamp. Um, and they come in slightly different sizes and sometimes you can get them like this is polished um, polished black, which is really cool. Um, I don't know where I got it, but I snarfed it up when I when I saw it. Um, all you do is take your your wire cutters, your your needle nose, anything with a wire cutter groove on it, and you put two. If you can see that, just put it in the wire cutter like that. Bingo! There's your eyes. And uh, time in is pretty straightforward. You can put it on hook, one, two, three across, and then go the opposite direction, one, two, three. Then you go up and under, up and under, a couple, two, three times. And then just for good measure, you can go around like so, kind of horizontally around the knot and finish her off like that. And it doesn't hurt at this point to look uh, from the front, make sure the eyes are horizontal to the, well, what do we wanna say? Perpendicular to the orientation of the bend. Yeah, all right. And again, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Zappagap. I'm gonna put Zappagap on here. Now I wanna tell you, this is dangerous. <laughs> Um, if you put too much zap gap right here, it can run down the thread into your bobbin. And when that happens, it pretty much destroys, makes the bobbin uh, unusable. And that happened to me once. So I'm gonna take a half hitch and I'm gonna again, use my, What is this thing called that I'm flipping it in and out of here? I know it's not a gallows, but I can't remember the name of it. I call it thread holder. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. I, I think I've heard it uh, called a bobbin cradle. A bobbin cradle, thank you, Kirk. Yeah, so I'm using the bobbin cradle just to keep the thread out of the way. The reason I put a half hitch on it is a lot of times if you put it in the cradle without a half hitch, it'll want to unroll. Um, in this case, if I came from behind the eyes, it wouldn't. So I'm just gonna put glue right in there, right between the eyes, and then I'm gonna roll it over and I'm gonna put glue right in there. And again, you know, you don't need a whole lot. That, see that drop on there? That is way too much. So I'm just gonna stick that on my bench and take what's left and put it in there and roll it over. And I can actually go down on my bench where I drop that drop and grab a tiny smidge more. Do that like that. All right, that's good. Now, there's only a couple other materials here on this fly. Um, we're gonna put a little bit of flash in it and then we're gonna put a little bit of um, Arctic Fox on it. Now the flash I have sitting around, what is that? I can't seem to find the flash at the moment. It was in a Ziploc bag because it was down to not much of it. Well, oh, here it's right here. Jeez, come on, man. There we go. All right. Uh, so, yeah, so this is Flashaboo. This is crystal flash. It's thinner and not as not as as flashy. Um, for really early season dirty water, I would use a fly with flash abu for maximum flash. But for this one, which is more of an intermediate to low water uh, fly, I'm just using a few strands of this crystal flash, and it's silver. And again, I got way too much. Um, I only want to have like four, four to six strands 
which means I only need two to two to three to start because I'm going to double it over because they're way longer than they need to be. So what do I have here? I have three and it's even <laughs> way longer than I need. But um, yeah, so I'm going to double it over and then I'm going to cut and you see what I'm doing here. I made a loop. I'm going to stick my scissors in and cut it like that. And now all the ends are the same length. That's the end I'm going to tie in. All right. So I turned it around. Oh, there's one hook length. I'm going to, I want it to stick out behind. So I'm going to give it probably two, two hook lengths, but I'm tying it in way up at the front here. Yeah, okay. And then I'm gonna roll it over on the vise and kind of loosely grab it down and tie it in behind and in front of the eyes so it's not going anywhere. Yeah, okay. So we got some on, on top and some behind. And that's longer than it needs to be. Let's trim it later, but that's about two hook lengths. That's good for starters. All right, now I'm, just to finish it, I'm going to put um, Arctic Fox on the bottom, and Arctic Fox on the top. Now this here is, and I love Arctic Fox. It's kind of like bucktail, only it's way more supple. Um, has lots of action in the water. And nowadays you can find it with different places and lots of different colors. Um, the, first, the first batch that I got, I actually got from somebody in Sweden who mailed it to me for Christmas one year. But um, this particular batch here has a ton of under fur and you really, don't want that. So I'm going to cut a fairly big chunk and strip all the under fur out. Yeah, what a crappy picture. Wish you could see that better. Anyway, I got my chunk of fur here. And uh, so I'm going to cut that. And again, I'm using the back end of my scissors because I don't want to damage the fine point on the front. Cut that as close as I can to the skin in one big chunk. Now, if you don't know, um, fur has, you know, a lot of furs have two components. They have guard hairs and then they have under fur. So these long things are the uh, guard hairs. That's what we want. And then you see this really dense stuff is under fur. So I'm going to, and a lot of it will just come off. So I just, just pull it like that. Uh, if you grip grip tight on on here, you'll avoid losing the part you want, and then you can kind of tease out all that under fur. Is it's kinky and it's um, stiff, and it will not provide the action we want. So, and here's a trick. So this is a um, a little comb. Um, this particular one is one you get when. Uh, you you have to treat some somebody for lice, which if you've had kids, you know is uh, happens from time to time, uh, usually in kindergarten or first grade. But uh, it's fine tooth comb. Any fine tooth comb will work, and uh, just comb out the, just pick it out, and and you can see it's collecting up all that under fur, um, and you really. This is this particular tail has tons of tons of it, and I don't want it in the fly, so I'm picking and picking and picking and getting as much of that out as I can.
and you can go as long as you want. I, I usually get bored after a while and quit, but probably. All right. So I've managed to get a lot of it out and I still have the tips are still all together, which is nice because that's how we want it to tie in. Now I've got a decent clump here. I'm actually gonna um, put half on top and half on the bottom. So I'm gonna separate this into two chunks. I'm gonna set one on my bench and hopefully a gust of wind won't come and mess that up. All right, I guess I, I pushed that back and I'm gonna bring this forward. Okay, this is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm gonna tie it in in front of the eyes. Starting from behind the eye, I'm gonna like do like an X from behind the fly to in front of the fly like so. I'm not gonna pinch it down tight. I'm gonna go loose back over the other way and come under and then down on top and I'm gonna go loose there too. The reason you go loose is if you pinch it, it might kink up and you kind of want it to lay flat, flattish uh, with the hook. So loose wraps first. And then after you get a little bit further down, now you can go some three, four tight wraps and I'm gonna cut most of this off. Do, 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 cut that, cut that. And at this point, you know, if it's not to your liking, it's, it's laying on one side or the other side, um, you can adjust it using your fingernail believe it or not, um, just kind of push it with your fingernail right in there and you can change how it lays on the, on the hook and everything. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna leave that just about like that, just tie that down. So now we're gonna rotate the fly over and we're gonna put the, the remainder of the, fox on the, on the top. Now, because we've got the hook bend right in the middle there, I'm gonna put it on in two pieces, one on each side. Um, I prefer to do it that way. You could put one big chunk on there and then try to separate it around the hook. Um, I just find it uh, more difficult to do that. So I'm gonna take some of this. I'm gonna lay it up on the side there. Take a few wraps. I don't like the way that worked. There we go, that's better. And I'm gonna take all the rest of it, put it on the other side and I'm just gonna do a quick measure, ensure I'm more or less the same length here. Again, real loose, slow, get it exactly where you want it. And then just, I just do a little little tugs to tighten it down, uh, two or three wraps. And then when you get in the front there, uh, you can be a little more snug with it. And cutting the rest off. Bingo. All right, now um, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna whip finish it again with my fingers. One, two, and you can actually, when you're whipping, you can actually um, build a head on the fly if you want, control where the wraps go, you know, tuck in a few errant fibers if they're sticking around, like that one right there. And if you run out of thread, just pull back, get a little more thread and you can actually feed thread into the loop and keep going, keep wrapping. All right, and now I'm gonna close it, uh, close it off like so, boom.
And once again, I'm gonna, if I can find my bobbin here. I'm gonna put some glue. Now I'm gonna use a little bit more Zappa Gap here. I want it to penetrate those threads. And there's not a lot of other stuff to get in the way. To, so but I'm using my bodkin to just put it on the thread, and keep it away from everything else. And I don't think I got any in the eye, so I'm not gonna clean the eye. Um, I did get a little bit on those hairs right there, so I'll get those off of there. Yeah, so there you go. There's a Cuta Creek streamer um, box. And, you know, one thing I like to do is uh, if you wet your fingers a little bit, you can slick back the fibers and get a feel for how it would look uh, underwater. So I'm just going to do that now. So you can kind of see it's, and it, of course, it would fish this way. Um, it was basically pretty nondescript little white, little white bait fish, a uh, little bit of eye there. And uh, of course, if you really want to dress it up, you can take a red magic marker, which I don't have. You could take a red magic marker and put a little, little red splash there for uh, gills, dress it up a little bit. But there you go. There's there's your basic uh, early season streamer for trout. It works really good on two year old, which tend to eat minnows more, and uh, a lot of action with the fox and and some flash. And of course, you, like I said, you can tie it with lead, and you can tie it with bead chain, so you have two different weights that'll fish at different depths. Hey, John, right. when, when um, you uh, fish this, um, do you fish it with with weight on the leader, or do you fish it with a floating line? Well, on on Cuda Creek, I fish it on a floating line with no sink tip or no split shot, and I, you know, if it's if the water's real high and I am worried about not getting down far enough, um, I'll put on something with uh, like you use for smallmouth, you know, with a uh, like a one thirty second lead eye. Okay, version so you go to version a heavier eye version. Yeah, okay. so I use a heavier fly, and I would also adjust the the depth of the fly by my cast um, and letting it sink, you know, before I start to swim it. If you know what I mean. So yeah, the, the deeper I want it to, to swim, the further upstream I'll cast it and let it sink before I start swinging it. So, you know, Cuta, Cuta has a few deep holes, but nothing, most of the time I'm fishing in, you know, two, three feet of water. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't think you need to resort to uh, intermediate lines or anything like that. You know, other, other places, yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know. All right. Um, so I'm I'm almost done for tonight. I yeah, and I've got about eight minutes, so that's perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show you the the one the one material easy easy fly that I would use in a one fly competition if I ever if I ever did that. And uh, I call it a damsel nymph mainly because that's what I was trying to imitate when I first tried tying it. Um, it's probably not the best imitation of a damselfly nymph. It may imitate a polywog or a small minnow or a bunch of stuff, um, but it, it works very well. So to save time, I'm just gonna use black thread uh, it's an olive fly, so obviously you probably use olive thread if you want it to be a little more proper about it. But 
But this starts off the same way as the last slide with the bead chain eye. So we'll go through that again and cut off another one. Blink. And it's the same hook. Uh, you can use a standard must add nymph hook if you want for this. This one's just a tad longer, but uh, doesn't matter all that much, I don't believe. And I'm gonna put this eye a little bit further toward the front than I did on the other one. Um, gives a little more of a jigging motion. And on the actual damsel nymph, the eyes are even further, they're right at the front of the, the body. All in all, I don't think it matters that much, but. All right, so that's on. And now I'm gonna take the thread to the back. Get it back there where I want it, put a half hitch on and yeah. Put a little, little bit of zappa gap on here. Good, all right. Okay, now for this, um, <clears throat> the one material is marabou and um, this is pretty good, good marabou that I've got here. It's blood quill, which is uh, nicer feathers. It's a nice olive, medium olive color. Uh, no idea where I got it, but it's a dollar sixty nine, so it must have been a while ago. <laughs> so you can see when you take when you take these out, they're all strung together, and it's kind of a pain. You get this big wad of feathers, but what you're looking for is uh, you see this this feather the way it stands up. You can see there's a stem in the middle and it fans out very nicely um, to either side. And it has a thin stem uh, that goes quite a way down. That's, that's a good feather for this fly, okay? So <clears throat> you just wanna separate it from the bunch and put the rest down. And then if there's any, um, Stuff way at the bottom where it's white and the stem is really fat. We're not going to use that, so you can strip that off. Um, put it in a pile on your on your bench in case you actually need a little bit later to finish it, but you probably won't. All right, now, um, so you might think we're going to use this part of the fly, but actually we're not we're going to cut that off because i i you know it's tempting to put that right there tie it in um and leave leave it be the tail but now you've got that stiff relatively stiff um center um barb in the tail and it's not going to move around the way it would if that wasn't there so we're going to strip the the barbs down and expose that tip and cut it off. Actually, yeah, actually, yeah. Cut that off. And one thing with marabou, when you're working with marabou, wet your hands and, and it'll just lay right down. Boom, perfect, all right. So now we've got some tail. Yeah, you know what? That's not enough tail. So here's where this other stuff comes in. So um, some of the stuff you stripped off the bottom of the feather has no center barb, just lots of long, long skinny feathers. Wet it, make it lay back, grab a little more, 
make it lay back, grab even a little more. I'm, I'm licking my fingers as you can't see me, but. All right, now measure one hook length, go back there, tie it in. Yeah, that's it, that's it. And I'm gonna tie one, two, three, cinch it down pretty good. And then I'm gonna lift this up and go under a few times, okay. <clears throat> and now I'm just gonna twist this up a little bit and wrap like so right up to there. And now I'm just gonna wrap it off, but I'm gonna wrap it the opposite way. So I'm counterwinding it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, come on. All right, and now because I like to wrap the opposite direction, I just went around the eyes there so I could reverse the, <clears throat> the flow of the thread. All right, now it looks kind of like crap on a hook, right? But I'm gonna cut this all off. These are all the, all the little white pieces and hard parts that we don't want, get rid of that. All right, so I'm happy with the back half of the fly. I just need a little bit more here on the front. So I'm gonna take this part of the, the feather. I mean, if you wanted to get fancy, you could palmer this thing up the, up the shank and it would make a beautiful, palmering means wrapping all the way around. But I'm gonna show you the way I normally tie it, which is just grab a chunk of marabou like that, flip her over, stick it on there. Tie that down. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Grab all those ends and just cut them off. That's basically it. And I'm just gonna put a whip finish on here. Hopefully get that stuff off of there. Come on. So it doesn't look like much. It's just marabou on a hook um, with bead chain. But you could catch pretty much anything on it. Carp, <clears throat> I've caught carp on it. Um, I've caught uh, 18 inch bass, smallmouth on this, several in fact, and everything in between. Uh, Schmung River, it should always, should, Always be in your Shimung River fly box because you never know. Uh, can't go wrong tying it on. And that's it. Um, Is that the color you would suggest, John? Or have you mixed things up? Have you ever got done two-tone? Or would you suggest all olive? I mean, I, I only do olive if you... It, you know, it started out as a damselfly nymph, and those are typically tied all olive. I think that's what, what color they are. Um, you can tie it in black. I do. I do have some that are all black, and they work pretty darn well. Um, you know, the shimung gets a really good hatch of toad polywogs. I guess you'd call them. Um, you see them in the shallows. They're black polywogs, 
and they they wiggle out like crazy and uh, i'm sure occasionally they make it out into the, the main river and become food so black is would be my secondary choice but i i don't tie them two tone i like it the fact that it's simple and easy and uh i mean there's no reason you couldn't try one color for the tail or one for the front or something like that mix it up if you wanted to but that's it Great. does anyone have any questions for john on the flies or any notes you've taken that you want to ask him now before we conclude so uh john on, on the last fly how would how do you fish that So most of the time, <clears throat> um, I most often I'm fishing it on the Shimung River, and you know, with my eight weight, I used to fish a seven weight. Now I fish an eight weight, floating standard uh, leader down to four X, and um, typically this fly is either. Um, late you know late summer when it's really low and really clear um you could even go 5x but it's uh it's great for that when the water's shallow and you're just um uh, you know fishing the riffles and in the runs uh it's also a really good choice if you're early season and the water's low and the fish are on beds um because it's it's small enough it won't spook the fish and you know you can target um, smallmouth on the beds and uh, drop it in their lap kind of thing and even even that time of year like you know mid-june <clears throat> one one time i just i did you know that island where i go in big flats i just walked around the island walking upstream and flopping that thing in front of me and i I caught some nice bass that way. So, John, do you catch any off the dock, uh, Kika, with that? No, not really. Um, it's funny. The, you, you'd think something like that would work good in the lake, yeah. but. Um, no. Uh, no, I mean when I when I when the bass are <clears throat> in shallow on Cuca, I'm, I'm usually throwing a bigger black woolly bugger of some kind, or sometimes a small black beadhead woolly bugger, even smaller than that. I mean, it would probably work. You know, I could probably. I just, I don't know. I yeah. I haven't fished it a lot up there, but. John, on your Arctic Fox, your your white streamer, um, you mentioned its effectiveness, obviously, for gear toward your talk, gear towards Cayuta. Have you scaled that for other species, uh, whether it be warm water and or uh, tributary fish? And if so, has it been successful? Well, I, I no, I, the answer, short answer is no, I haven't scaled it. It doesn't scale up in size well because you're limited by the length of the foxtail fibers. Um, you know, they, they're only so long and I guess you could tie them, you could use, a, you know, you could tie some in the back of the hook and then some in the front of the hook and make it a bit longer, or you could even tie it in segments if you really wanted to get into it. But no, I haven't done any of that. Um, you know, if I wanted a bigger fly, I, I would use different materials that are longer, I guess. Looks looks pretty deadly, the the sparseness of it and the, that flash. I mean, it looks pretty looks like it's pretty effective. Yeah, I mean, and anywhere you have a, a pattern that calls for bucktail, traditionally, you know, Mickey Finn or something, or any 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 streamer where it says bucktail, you could use fox instead as long as it's not you're not tying it, you know, on a size two hook or or bigger. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's way more um, 
flexible and you, you get way more motion in the water with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. Yeah, that's great. It's kind of like, it's kind of got the motion of marabou, but it's much more durable than marabou. You know, if you, yeah. if you fish marabou a lot, you, you know, two or three fish and it starts to look ragged. And after a while, you know, I have, a, I have some woolly buggers here that I, over the course of the winter, I'm gonna put them on device and tie the tail back in because mm -hmm. there's no tail left, you know. Mm -hmm. Cool. But it, it happens with the fox, it's more durable. Any other questions uh, for John? No. Hey, I want to thank everybody for sticking with it tonight, uh, despite the technical problems. Uh, and uh, I hope you all learned something. I enjoyed it. Did a great job. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to share it and uh, more than happy to, you know, do, do part two later on with better equipment and. Yep. yep. So show uh, you some more stuff. Yeah. Um, on that note. Uh, yeah, we will, I'll be working with you, John and, and, and TC and Kirk on our new camera setup. And actually I think it's going to be an added benefit of uh, getting comfortable with that for this part two. And uh, I will coordinate with everyone here on the line uh, for rescheduling that part two. And um, if there's no other questions, I will, uh, I will conclude uh, tonight's uh, Zoom session. Thank you very much for attending. And thank you, thanks again, John. And uh, stay tuned. Sure. I'll, be in, I'll be in contact with everyone on uh, part two of this presentation. So um, I will. All right. Uh, Good night. Conclude the uh, Zoom. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, thanks, thanks John. Again, John. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.